Hello students, welcome to the online tutorial for 2015 Shakespeare Tragedy class. This time we're going to look at the balcony scene uh, from the second play we study in this semester, that is Romeo and Juliet. And we know that uh, before they have this uh, demonstration of their innermost feelings towards each other on the balcony, uh, Romeo actually sees Juliet uh, in a party held by the Capulets. And in this party, Romeo sees Juliet for the first time, and he's very much overwhelmed uh, by Juliet's beauty. And that's why he says, Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night as a rich jewel in an Ethiop's ear, beauty too rich for use, for earth to dear. So these beautiful rhyming couplets actually make us feel that this man is so much uh, in love with this woman he just sees. And of course, all the readers know that uh, in the very beginning part of the play, Romeo's still very much in love with another girl called Rosalind. And um, somehow, Julia's beauty makes him believe that this should be the real one. Huh? And of course, this also uh, incites us to think about this question. That is, uh, do you believe in love at first sight? Do you think it's possible for a man or a woman to fall in love with the opposite sex uh, just by looking at this person uh, by a glance? So uh, this kind of question uh, should be regarded as a very core for this play. That's why I often say uh, Romeo and Juliet is not just a play about love. It's actually much more a play about young love. Young love is very often much more innocent and sometimes you can even say naive than mature love. And in this case, uh, the balcony scene actually demonstrate uh, that sort of naive quality uh, very often held by younger lovers. I hope I'm, I, do, I don't sound patronizing uh, because uh, as life moves on, we all know that we have to go through different stages. And when you are younger, when you don't really have so much experience with the world, you tend to think uh, what you see is for you to believe. But somehow uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet tells us that there's a much more complicated world out there uh, if we don't really uh, get to know uh, the world uh, with deeper thoughts. So on the balcony scene, um, on the balcony, uh, you can see that uh, Romeo actually sneaks into uh, the garden of the Capulets and he sees Juliet standing on the balcony alone, uh, trying to utter something. And of course, as he moves closer, Juliet's words become much clearer to him. And here in the uh, second act, uh, in scene one, right? Uh, you can see that uh, Romeo's kind of curious about what Juliet is talking about. And uh, Juliet actually utters some words like, Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, be but sworn, my love, and I will no longer be a capulet. Here, uh, Juliet expresses her feelings uh, quite secretively. Uh, somehow he hope, she hopes that Ro Romeo can deny his own father's name. And if he doesn't want to, as long as he can swear that he loves Juliet, she can do the same thing you know, for this man. Huh? So uh, you can see this sort of innocent thinking can only appear uh, with the young ones. Somehow, doving, you know, to get rid of one's name is not such an easy thing. Huh? So uh, when she says, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore, wherefore means why. Why are you Romeo? We know that uh, this woman somehow believed that uh, this name is, his, is her enemy, you know, nothing else. Uh, in Romeo, you know, it's all beauty, it's all greatness. Somehow she cannot believe that this name has to be attached to someone this perfect. Huh? So she really wants Romeo to give up on his name. But of course, we know that this speech is designed to show that innocent quality uh, possessed by Juliet. She's in love and, you know, um, maybe she doesn't really know what kind of love she's expecting. But this love t 
takes place so naturally. Uh, once uh, she receives uh, this kiss from Romeo, she just feels that wow, this is the kind of sweetness uh, I would love to uh, possess, you know, in my life. So now uh, she's very much like uh, murmuring to herself, you know, she's saying that. Well, why are you called Romeo? Huh? If you can deny your father, you know, I think I can also stop being a capulet. Huh? All right, then Romeo approaches closer and then he said, shall I hear more or shall I speak at this? Well, Juliet, of course, not finding uh, Romeo, uh, she continues. Huh? So she says, tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague, What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in the name? That which we call a rose, by any other word, would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection, which he owes, without that title. Romeo, doth thy name. And for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. So, you can totally see uh, Juliet's devotion in this uh, longer speech. Huh? First, she argues the necessity of a name. Huh? Because you are only my enemy when you are called Romeo Montague. Huh? So, if you doff that name, you know, you give up on that name, I can totally see that we can match so perfectly huh? so it is only you but only your name that is my enemy you are yourself though not a montague right you are just you you are not anyone uh you know close to or related to montague so what's montague well this family name of yours it is nor hand it is not hand not foot not arm not face, not any part belonging to a man. It is not any part of your body. And we know, of course, your body carries your soul. And your body is very much like this very important uh, op operator. You know, they can direct uh, your soul towards some direction. And uh, since it's not so important, you know, if you give up that name and you can invent a new identity for yourself and that essence that you that you know whole of your body can still stay perfect the way you are huh? so it's not anything that can be torn apart from your body right so it is not hand not foot so she's arguing that a name is not as important as uh, your physical part right so she hopes that he can have another name, huh? So she says, oh, be some other name. What's in the name? Then after giving this topic sentence, you know, be some other name, she starts to argue, what is in a name? What's the significance of a name? Well, look at this example. Huh? So she uses an example to support the controlling idea in that argument. Huh? So she says, that which we call a rose by any other word, would smell as sweet. If we don't call a rose a rose, we call it something else. And this rose would just smell as sweet as it always does. So you don't really have to insist on being a rose in order to make yourself cherishable. right? So that name can be changed at any time. But of course, uh, the readers, the audience might be soaking themselves in that kind of romantic feelings when Juliet says something like this. Still, their consciousness would actually remind them that uh, things cannot be this plain, cannot be this simple. Your name has been attached to you uh, for their age, like for 14 years, right, up till now, and it's definitely not so easy for you to switch you to a different name, and you can still have your identity integral to yourself. So, uh, on the one hand, we admire Juliet's love for Romeo. On the other, somehow we also identify that sort of uh, naive quality uh, possessed by Juliet. You know, she can be that naive. Uh, well, but of course, uh, 
as a matter of fact she is huh? and she's just demonstrating this to show that well very often that purity of love can be seen through young lovers and for this young girl who's really not experienced in love in any way at least we know that Romeo's experienced in love uh, even though not very deep still uh, he's more advanced uh, in terms of the business of love huh? and Juliet is actually quite simple in that aspect she sees this man uh, she feels that uh, this man is for her so uh, here on the balcony she's uttering her innermost feelings just like this I hope you can dove your name and you can take a new identity and together we'll make a wonderful couple huh? so she says uh, scenes a rose will still smell as sweet when it's not called a rose so Romeo would were he were he not Romeo called if he is not called Romeo all right so Romeo will still retain that dear perfection which he owns he owes without that title he owes he owns without being called Romeo so even though when he's not called Romeo he will still be that dear perfect man uh, as I know um, so Romeo doff thy name and for thy name which is no part of thee take all myself you know so now uh, please promise me you can just shake off that name you know just give it away um, and for your name you know let's just vow on this um, which is no part of thee your name is not a part of you you can take me now of course when a woman says take all myself is very much like uh, she would very much like to give everything she owns to this man so you know you can have me huh all right so of course upon hearing this Romeo is all excited so he shouts I take thee at thy word call me by love and I'll be new baptized really beautiful wording here new baptized so I'll very much like to be reborn you know so I will have a new name I will have a new identity huh? so with your love you know I don't know how to call myself you know and uh, if you can just call me love love means us you know we are now on this agreement huh? we are both in love we love each other so you can just call me love huh? and with this word I'll be new baptized of course uh, if you're born Christian be baptized huh? and you will get your name and you will get your religious identity and here uh, you're only saying that once uh, you really recognize my love for you you know I'll be just like a newborn man and henceforth I never will be Romeo huh? so he can also uh, give up on his identity you know his family name he doesn't really care so much about it anymore since now he feels that Juliet is also very much in love with him huh? and at this moment Julia is very much shocked huh? what man are thou that thus be screened in night hiding in night so stumblest on my counsel on my counsel means my innermost feeling or my innermost voice huh? and you stumble stumblest of course this is archaic English so you stumble on my counsel you just run into my innermost feelings because I was actually uttering my voice in secret but somehow you are hiding in the darkness and you are overhearing what I've been saying huh? all right and Romeo now exposes his real identity huh? by a name I know not how to tell thee who I am my name dear saint is hateful to myself because it is an enemy to thee had I written I would tear the word all right you know now because my name is your enemy Huh? so it's also my enemy so we are one and also he addresses Juliet as the saint so of course by this clue Juliet is totally aware that this man hiding in darkness is actually the man she met in a party huh? so since you hate my name now this name is also my enemy huh? if I wrote it I would have it torn you know this word I would just have it torn apart I don't really want to see the name huh? so this man is willing to make the same kind of sacrifice so you can see that by beautifully playing with words Shakespeare builds this tension of love up to a very high level bit by bit he just leads us to believe that you know as I said earlier they didn't really have a lot of time to fall in love with each other 
uh, because the major dramatic action in this play uh, is about killing Thibault and also uh, Romeo being uh, expelled from the city of Verona. Huh? So we know there are a lot of dramatic actions waiting to take place. So they don't really have a lot of time to themselves, right? So they can only have this secret world in a garden. And this is the place where they're just going to make the vow to get married with each other. So we know that uh, Shakespeare will have to use his words very, very carefully and also quite efficiently so that the readers can be uh, guided to understand what he's getting at. Um, so here, uh, he echoes his Juliet's love very quickly. Huh? So Juliet responds like this, My ears have yet not drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's uttering, yet I know the sound. Art thou not Romeo and Montague? Huh? So now she recognizes who he is. And Romeo says, Neither, fair maid, if either thee dislike. If you dislike either of them, then I'm not Romeo, and I'm not Montague, okay? I am who you want me to be. So this love has been constructed to meet the purpose of this play. We know this play, uh, of course, leads to a tragic ending. And usually a tragic ending is caused by some sort of mistake or personality flaw or uh, problems, conflicts uh, that are not very well handled. And in this play, we know their innocence uh, is the most beautiful part of their love, but also we know their innocence could actually lead them to a very dangerous state. And of course, as it as the play opens, we know that uh, finally uh, Romeo and Juliet they die at the end of the play, and this makes this play a famous tragedy. Huh? And here we can actually look back at that speech uttered by Juliet, when she says, uh, What's in a name that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet? So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, pretend that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Well, this is very much like she's living in her utopia. Huh? Uh, she's very well protected by her parents, obviously, and even though her parents have already arranged a marriage for her, she really uh, did not know what love was all about uh, at that stage. And since now, uh, she has encountered this man by herself, and she knows what love should be tasting like um, by herself. Uh, she has her own say. She's trying to make her own decision. And Shakespeare makes this kind of uh, problem uh, enlarged uh, as the play uh, moves forward. Huh? So, uh, very much like what I said before, uh, tragedy always uh, results in some sort of misjudgment or one's uh, personal problem, you know, the kind of flaw that would blind this person. Uh, very much like Macbeth, he would not uh, admit to his own weakness uh, as over greedy, okay? Uh, very often, uh, Romeo and Juliet, they are also blinded by their personal problems. They don't really know uh, the kind of love they could have, or they don't really have the kind of patience very often demanded uh, in such a situation. Um, being young, being naive, or being innocent, you know, uh, you have so much uh, to see, you have so much uh, to know, and at this moment, somehow they just believe that they are like the rescuers for each other. So, uh, somehow Juliet, uh, she, when she says, you know, the name doesn't matter, this actually is a very good embodiment for the loss of their love at the end. I suppose this is what I would like to tell you and share with you uh, for this part of the play. And this part, uh, the balcony scene, because of the beautiful wording and also because of the um, careful arrangement of a situation uh, that would be paving the way for the tragedy to take place. Uh, it has played a very important role in this play. All right, next time we'll be looking at another famous speech in this wonderful play.